Godmorgen, og velkommen til dagens webinar med overskriften Sæt skub i din bæredygtige virksomhedsstrategi. Mit navn det er Jesper Andersen. Jeg er chef for vores Data Intelligence Team i PwC Danmark, og så har jeg også æren af at lede vores agenda omkring bæredygtighed i consulting. Vi har alle sammen glædet os meget til at dele nogle af vores erfaringer med jer i dag omkring bæredygtighed og virksomhedsstrategi, og hvordan man får noget et emne, som, er, som i virkeligheden er super komplekst og meget omfangsrigt, til at være noget, der er meget praktisk og operationelt almindeligt. Fokus i dag har et teknisk tilsnit, og det har det, fordi det er den primære driver for, at vi kan, kan accelerere nogle af de her ting, og for at vi kan få noget hjælp til at lave den her rapportering, som er så, så omfangsrig. Jeg er derfor også i dag så heldig at være flankeret af tre dygtige kollegaer, jeg har Ida fra vores People Organization, som vil fortælle os lidt om uh, business transformation, uh, omkring de her omstillinger i virksomhederne, hvad man gør ved det. Uh, jeg har Richard herovre, som vil tale uh, lidt til, hvordan vi kommer fra regulering uh, over til rapportering uh, den, den vej. Og så har jeg Joe, som uh, vil fortælle os lidt om, uh, hvordan uh, en af vores leverandører af en platform, Regiva, uh, bruger teknologi til at hjælpe os med at lave den her rapportering på, uh, på nogle datapunkter, der kan være, ja, som jeg har sagt før, Øh, rigtig omfangsrige. Øhm, og her er billederne af os. Øh, vores agenda bliver lidt i den stil. Øh, jeg kommer med lidt mere instruktion nu her, men ellers så er det som sagt Ida, der fortæller øh, os lidt om det her business transformation. Richard, der, der, der taler lidt til, øh, til det her rapportering, og så kommer vores IBA. Og så har vi tænkt os at slutte af med en øh, Q&A, hvor I forhåbentlig har en hel masse spørgsmål, vi kan få lov til at svare. På, og hvis I ikke har så mange, så har vi selv forberedt nogen, så det kan ikke gå helt galt. Men, men brug funktionen i, i, i jeres viewer til at stille de her spørgsmål undervejs efterhånden, som det kommer. Så følger vi op på det til sidst. Godt. Det her bæredygtighedstema, det fylder rigtig meget derude, og det kan vi se bare i, i antallet af tilvendinger, der er til både vores webinarrække og det her webinar i dag. Men det er faktisk også sådan, når vi laver vores markedsundersøgelser, at vi kan fornemme, at der sker noget. Et kæmpe flertal af forbrugere derude er faktisk parat til at, 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 at sige, eller skifte leverandør, hvis ens leverandør ikke har et, et bæredygtigt, en bæredygtig strategi eller, eller handler uetisk. Op mod en tredjedel af virksomheden har også fundet ud af, at det rent faktisk er god forretning at tage det her bæredygtighed seriøst. Og specielt inden for diversitet, så ser vi, at de virksomheder, som tager det seriøst, rent faktisk også er mere profitable. Og egentlig så er vi op mod halvdelen af vores CEOs, som, som, som nu indser, at hvis man skal have en, en, en bæredygtig forretning om 10 år, så er man altså nødt til at omstille sig rigtig hæftigt, og måske sågar gå igennem en, det, vi kalder en transformation. Og lige, lige netop det sidste øh, tema, det, det, det gør jo, at man ude i virksomheden og ude i organisationerne øh, faktisk taler rigtig meget om, okay, hvad betyder det her for os? Hvordan får, vi, øh, hvordan får vi hænderne rundt om det? Hvad er det, vi egentlig skal gøre? Der er jo masser spørgsmål. Der er jo spørgsmål om, hvordan man får øh, de her ikke-finansielle data til at være lige så øh, dygtige og gode øh, at rapportere på som de finansielle data. Der er spørgsmål omkring, øh, vores, øh, hvor det data så i det hele taget er henne. Øh, hvordan, hvordan finder vi det, og hvordan styrer vi det, at vi har det rigtige, og det er i, i, i et godt format. Øh, hvad er det for nogle teknologier, øh, der, der er i spil? Er vores økosystem omkring teknologi, er det på plads? Er der noget, der, der, der skal laves om? Og egentlig, hvordan tager vi nu her de her beslutninger omkring vores omstilling øh, på, et, øh, på et grundlag, som gør, at vi er nogenlunde øh, sikre og komfortable med, at, øh, at det er den rigtige retning? Og alt det her, det, det peger en lille smule ind i det her uh, transformation og det her uh, omstillingstema uh, der. Så Ida, vil du ikke uh, tage os lidt videre? Jo, det kan du tro. Så den næste sektion kommer til at handle om bæredygtig forretningstransformation. Uh, og der er, som uh, Jesper nævner, rigtig mange forskellige spørgsmål, der popper op i forbindelse med ESG og bæredygtighed. Nogle af de største udfordringer, vi oplever og ser ud i markedet af virksomheder, de slås med, det er de fire temaer, I ser på venstre siden her. Så det er integration af data og krav til data i eksisterende og nye teknologier. Det er datahåndtering, der kommer til at være et stigende behov, behovet allerede nu, men et stigende behov for at kunne indsamle, bearbejde og håndtere data, så den her rapportering kommer til at blive gnidningsfri og nøjagtigt transparent. 
Så er der nogle udfordringer i forbindelse med risikohåndtering, og det handler om at skulle håndtere de her bæredygtighedsrisici og gøre det som en del af den eksisterende risikohåndtering, eller få det etableret, hvis den ikke eksisterer endnu. Og så er der hele det her tema omkring transformation. Det handler jo dels om at kunne leve op til nogle lovkrav på rapporteringselementet, men det handler i lige så høj grad om at flytte sig fra compliance-aspektet og over i reelt set at gøre noget anderledes i den måde, man driver sin forretning på. Udover de her interne øh, udfordringer, så er der også et pres fra omverdenen øh, på virksomheder i dag, og presset bliver kun større. Øhm, det sker i øh, stigende takt med, at øh, bæredygtighed vinder mere og mere indpas i markedet. Og presset kommer fra forskellige steder, blandt andet fra regulering, der bliver udstedt af myndigheder. Det gælder blandt andet CSRD, som kommer fra EU, som øh, Richard vil sige et øh, par ord om, men som vi også har et særskilt webinar øh, omkring, der allerede er blevet afholdt, og som man kan finde på pvc.dk. Så er der et pres fra kapitalmarkeder, der er et pres fra investorer, som har deres egen bæredygtighedsagenda og et behov for at vise, at deres investeringer også er grønne og dermed også et pres til virksomheder for at blive mere grønne og bæredygtige investeringer. Derudover stiller banker højere og højere krav, før de stiller kapital til rådighed. Og så er der et pres fra kunder og samarbejdspartnere. Kunder søger i højere og højere grad bæredygtige produkter og ydelser. Og derudover stiller øh, leverandører og i stigende, krav, øh, stigende grad krav til, øh, til dem, de samarbejder med. Der er rigtig mange virksomheder, som stadig har fokus på compliance-aspektet. Og det er også rigtig vigtigt for at være en spiller i markedet. Det er, hvad vi kalder license to operate. Men det er også super vigtigt for at kunne forløse sit fulde potentiale, at man skifter fokus øh, over på, hvordan skal vi gøre tingene anderledes i fremtiden. Hvad mener vi så, når vi taler om bæredygtig forretningstransformation? Hvis vi starter med at tale om transformation og hvad der ligger i det ord, så handler det grundlæggende om forandring. Og for at forklare det nærmere, så skældner vi typisk mellem transformation og transition. Det er begge to typer forandringer. Transformation er mere komplekst, det er bredere funderet og påvirker typisk den samlede virksomhed. Det indebærer ofte en ny strategi. Helt nye måder at tænke på, ny adfærd, nye behov for kompetencer, hvor transition er mindre komplekst, fordi det kan være gradvist eller påvirker en mindre del af forretningen. Så vi finder os altså i den komplekse ende af skalaen. Når vi så taler om bæredygtig forretningstransformation, så definerer vi det i PVC som en proces, hvor igennem vi justerer en virksomheds drift, praksiser og politikker med henblik på at gøre den mere finansielt levedygtig og samtidig mere miljømæssigt og socialt bevidst. Så det handler altså om at gennemføre en proces, hvor vi skaber et bedre udgangspunkt for virksomheden, et bedre udgangspunkt for succes og profit, samtidig med at man minimerer negative påvirkninger på samfundet og maksimerer positive påvirkninger på samfundet. Og når vi så taler om justering af drift og driftsmodel, så har vi nogle eksempler her på, hvilke dele af en operating model, der vil blive påvirket af en sådan transformation. Og bare for at give nogle eksempler, så er det eksempelvis strategi. Det handler om at få etableret en ESG-strategi og få den til at gennemsyre forretningsstrategien. Det er ved introduktion af nye målsætninger, science-based targets, net zero, net negative, 100% cirkularitetsmål osv., som er fuldstændig afgørende for, at man også kan gøre noget anderledes fremadrettet, at det bliver en ledestjerne. I forhold til organisation, så er det vigtigt, at man forholder sig til, hvor skal ansvaret for bæredygtighed ligge henne i ens forretning. Der er helt sikkert et ansvar på ledelsesniveau. Det er noget, der skal drøftes i bestyrelse på direktionsniveau. Men det er også afgørende, at man overvejer, hvordan kan man sikre et ansvar og et ejerskab længere nede i organisationen. Data og teknologi kommer vi til at fokusere meget mere på senere i webinaret, så dem springer jeg hen over. Proces er i høj grad noget, der potentielt kan blive påvirket, afhængig af hvilken virksomhed vi taler om. Men det handler både om at kigge på ens egen, øh, egne processer end-to-end. -end. Hvordan er det, vi producerer vores produkt, for eksempel? Er der nogle ting, vi skal gøre anderledes der for at blive mere bæredygtige? Men det er også ved at kigge på den samlede værdikæde. Hvad sker der upstream, og hvad sker der downstream? Den måde, vi sourcer vores materialer på. Er der behov for nogle justeringer til den proces, og lige sådan den måde, vi transporterer vores produkt på, eksempelvis til vores kunder, er der noget, der skal justeres i den forbindelse. I forhold til mennesker, så handler det i høj grad om opkvalificering og mobilisering af ledere og medarbejdere i organisationen. 
Man kan som ledelse sætte nogle overordnede mål for en virksomhed og i talesætte de overordnede udfordringer. Men for at løse dem, så er det fuldstændig afgørende, at man får mobiliseret den samlede organisation og får sikret et ejerskab blandt dem, der også er helt tæt på driften. Og til sidst er der et behov for at kigge på de konkrete produkter, man har som virksomhed. Er de bæredygtige i sig selv? Er der nogle produkter, der skal udgå af porteføljen? Er der nogle nye, der skal ind? Så der er altså rigtig mange elementer, der potentielt kan blive påvirket af den her type af transformation. Hvis man lykkes med den her transformationsrejse, så er der rigtig mange positive øh, resultater at hente derude. Øh, Jesper har allerede været øh, lidt inde på det, øh, men her har vi nogle eksempler øh, med. Et element er, at man kan sikre, at bæredygtighed bliver indlejret i alle beslutninger, der træffes i en virksomhed. Og det handler både om, at man som ledelse ved noget om bæredygtighed og ESG, øh, og rent faktisk har et udgangspunkt for at træffe beslutninger på den baggrund, men også, at man ser en virksomheds præstation som noget større og noget mere end finansiel performance, og at man også begynder at tage miljømæssige og sociale forhold ind i den vurdering. Et andet positivt udfald er, at man har en opkvalificeret medarbejderskare, som er i stand til både at forstå, men også at kunne efterleve de ESG-forpligtelser, man sætter sig som virksomhed. Så er der et element af værdiskabelse for, for ens egen virksomhed. Der er både studier og erfaringer, der viser, at der er en positiv sammenhæng mellem at sætte sig ind i ESG, og at det gennemsyrer alle sine aktiviteter og den måde, man driver på retten på, og så reel værdiskabelse. Så vi taler påvirkning på toplinjevækst, på produktivitet, på afkast af investeringer og en række andre forskellige parametre, samtidig med, at man får skabt nogle positive resultater for det omkringliggende samfund. Den sidste element her handler om at være responsiv i forhold til det pres, vi talte om tidligere øh, fra omverdenen. Hvis man sætter et link imellem overordnet ESG-forpligtelser og den måde, man driver sin forretning på, så er man også bedre i stand til at kunne imødekomme øh, de henvendelser, man får fra kunder og samarbejdspartnere og hvem det ellers kan være. For at gøre bæredygtig transformation øh, lidt mere håndgribelig, så har vi taget et konkret kundeeksempel med her. Den her kunde er et datterselskab af en global virksomhed i forbrugsindustrien, som havde en ambition omkring at opnå 100% plastikgenanvendelse. Og den udfordring, den her virksomhed stod over for, var, at datterselskabet alene fra sin egen produktion genererede mere end 100.000 tons plastikaffald årligt. Øhm, kunden varetog selv den her håndtering af plastikaffaldet, men også genvinding, men lykkedes altså ikke, på det her tidspunkt med at gøre det effektivt, øh, omkostningsbevidst, og heller ikke at nå det her niveau af cirkularitet, som de ønskede. Så det PVC øh, hjalp med i det her konkrete tilfælde, det var at udvikle et langsigtet roadmap, altså en langsigtet plan for, øh, hvordan man kan opnå det her 100% plastikgenvinding målsætning øh, gennem en række forskellige projekter, øh, leverancer og aktiviteter. Uh, Udover at man uh, lykkedes med på baggrund af det her roadmap at opnå uh, compliance med uh, lovkrav fra de lokale myndigheder, så nåede man også nogle forretningsmæssige fordele. Blandt andet at blive mindre afhængig af ny plastik ved at genanvende plastik i langt højere grad. Uh, derudover så udviklede vi også en digital løsning, som uh, hjalp kun med at få data på, hvordan håndterer vi helt konkret Affaldet. Så det skabte transparens øh, i ens øh, reelle praksis, øh, og det gav også en mulighed for at træffe beslutninger og udvikle nye strategier på den her baggrund. Et sidste rigtig positivt element øh, i den her case var, at som en del af den her plan, øh, vi udviklede, så var der også nogle konkrete handlinger, som øh, gjorde det muligt for kunden at genanvende plastik fra særligt miljøfølsomme områder, det vil sige at minimere negativ påvirkning på de områder, og samtidig skabe beskæftigelse for den lokale befolkning, som kunne skaffe sig et levebrød, så også en positiv påvirkning inden for sociale forhold. Hvordan lykkes man så med den her type af transformation? Hvordan bærer man sig i hele taget ad? I PVC der bruger vi den her femtrins model på global plan, til at strukturere transformationsrejsen. Og den er inddelt i fem forskellige faser, som hver især i talesætter og besvarer et væsentligt spørgsmål. Vores første fase hedder modenhed og baselining. Og det er her, hvor vi besvarer spørgsmålet, hvor er det, man som virksomhed står lige nu. Så ved at kigge nærmere på, hvad er det for en konkret påvirkning, virksomheden har for det omkringliggende samfund, hvad er det for nogle risici og muligheder, hvordan benchmarker den her virksomhed sig op imod konkurrenter osv., så får man altså et billede af, 
Hvor står vi i dag, og hvad er vores handlemuligheder? Den næste fase handler om strategiudvikling. Så det handler om at kigge øh, nogle år ud i fremtiden og sige, hvad er det, vi gerne vil opnå? Er det net zero, eller er det net negative? Hvad er det for øh, ordnede strategier, vi kan udvikle på baggrund af, hvor vi står i dag? Den tredje fase handler om transformation, planlægning og roadmap. Og det kommer lidt tilbage til den case, jeg fortalte om før. Så hvordan er det, vi når de målsætninger, vi sætter os? Hvad er det for nogle overordnede aktiviteter, der skal til her over den næste årrække, for at vi kan lykkes med den målsætning? Implementeringen handler så om at komme meget, meget tæt på de konkrete løsninger, der skal til. Det, vi besvarer her, det er, hvad er det, der skal til? Hvad er det, der skal ændres øh, helt konkret, for at vi når målsætningerne? Så her udvikler man og implementerer løbende løsninger. Og i den sidste fase handler det om operationalisering øh, og levering af øh, de positive vedvarende resultater. Og det, svar, at det spørgsmål, vi besvarer i øh, den her fase, det er, hvordan måler vi og kommunikerer vi vores præstationer? Øh, og hvordan kan man løbende sikre øh, forbedring øh, af de, øh, de ting, man implementerer? Under hver fase øh, kan der ligge øh, en masse forskellige typer af leverancer og, og særskilte projekter. Øh, vi har ikke tid til at gennemgå dem alle sammen i dag, så vi fremhæver nogle enkelte eksempler og sætter lidt ord på dem. Bare for at eksemplificere, hvad det er, der ligger under øh, den her transformationsrejse. Så hvis vi kigger i øh, den første fase, der har vi øh, dobbeltvæsenlighedsvurderinger. Det er også noget, vi har i talsat i et tidligere webinar, som man kan høre lidt nærmere om der. Men det handler grundlæggende om at analysere, hvad er påvirkningen på samfundet? Hvad er påvirkningen fra samfund på virksomhed? Og hvad er det så reelt set for nogle emner, man som virksomhed skal rapportere på for at leve op til lovkravene? Og når man er færdig med den her analyse, en ting er, at man ved, hvad er det er for nogle parametre, man skal rapportere på. Man ved også, hvad er det er for nogle væsentlige emner, jeg skal forholde mig til som virksomhed. Og det er et rigtig godt input til den næste fase, hvor vi kigger ned i strategiudvikling. For for hver af de her punkter, hvor man virkelig har en påvirkning på det omkringliggende samfund, der kan man så vurdere, hvordan, hvad er det er for nogle strategier, der skal til, for at vi kan lykkes med eksempelvis at minimere negativ påvirkning. Hvad er det for nogle KPI'er, vi skal sætte os? Hvad er det for nogle ambitioner, vi skal have? Så det næste umiddelbart skridt øh, vil naturligt være strategiudvikling. Og i den tredje fase, der har vi capability assessment, øh, og tæt koblet til det er øh, opkvalificering af ledere og medarbejdere. Og det vil jeg fortælle en lille smule mere om. Så uanset om du er i starten af din transformationsrejse, eller om du allerede er godt i gang, så er opkvalificering af ledere og medarbejdere øh, og deres kompetencer jo fuldstændig afgørende for at lykkes. Som jeg var inde på tidligere, så kan man som øh, ledelse ikke løfte den her øh, øh, opgave alene. Det er fuldstændig afgørende, at man får mobiliseret alle medarbejdere i at finde de rigtige løsninger for fremtiden. Der er rigtig mange øh, gode årsager til at, at kigge nærmere på det. Øh, blandt andet øh, er en fordel, at man sikrer, at beslutninger bliver truffet på et informeret grundlag. Blandt andet ved at beslutningstagere rent faktisk er opkvalificeret og ved noget omkring ESG og bæredygtighed. Så skaber det også øget engagement blandt medarbejdere, at de ved, at det her det er noget, der er fokus på øh, i ens virksomhed, øh, og at man bliver taget med på rejsen og rent faktisk kan gøre en forskel. Ved at hver funktion eller hver forretning, som ved, hvordan de kan påvirke øh, og leve op til ESG-forpligtelserne, men så får de også en mulighed for at arbejde sig i den rigtige retning. Det kræver bare, at de har den viden. Og til sidst så øh, vil en opkvalificering af ledere og medarbejdere også gøre det muligt at skabe de her innovative løsninger fra bunden, og op igennem organisationen. Det er de medarbejdere, der er helt tæt på den daglige proces, den daglige drift, der har muligheden for at se, hvad er det for nogle ting, vi kan gøre anderledes og smartere fremadrettet, for at blive mere bæredygtige. Men det kræver et bundniveau af viden omkring ESG, for at man kan navigere i netop det. Det er jo ikke nødvendigvis en nem rejse at gå fra, hvor man står i dag, til en fuldt opkvalificeret medarbejderskare. I PVC der plejer vi at arbejde med de her tre overordnede behov, som man skal i talesætte som en del af det for at lykkes med og kvalificering. Øhm, for det første handler det om at engagere sine medarbejdere og ledere, så få skabt fokus på bæredygtighed, for i talesætte, at det er et super vigtigt område, og det er noget, alle skal tage ansvar for, og få skabt den begejstring blandt ledere og medarbejdere. Så handler det om at opkvalificere, så få skabt det her bundniveau, som jeg nævnte før, af viden omkring ESG, men også have et fokus på, hvad er det for nogle underliggende øh, øh, målgrupper, man har som virksomhed? Det er ikke sikkert, at salg skal vide det samme omkring bæredygtighed som produktion eller som HR osv. Så, så have et fokus på, hvad er det konkrete behov, og prøv at italesætte det.
Og så handler det om empowerment, altså at man styrker sine medarbejdere. En ting er at give dem de her, øh, den her viden og kompetencer. Noget andet er at give dem en arena for at øh, udøve det, de har lært. Øh, så give dem muligheden for at bruge den her viden i praksis og skabe øh, nogle feedback-mekanismer, så de her bæredygtige, innovative løsninger også kan komme tilbage til beslutningstager. Der findes rigtig mange øh, gode muligheder for at opkvalificere sig på det her emne øh, ude i markedet. Vores anbefaling er, at I starter med at kigge på, hvad er jeres øh, kapabiliteter i dag? Hvad er behovet for fremtiden, og hvordan får I lukket det gap? Øh, sådan så I får fokuseret præcist ind på jeres øh, behov for ny viden og nye kompetencer, før I øh, begynder at designe jeres eget eller vælge noget øh, off the shelf. Før jeg giver ordet videre, så vil jeg lige komme med nogle øh, do's and don'ts, altså nogle, øh, nogle råd fra vores side, øh, som øh, vi har lært øh, efterhånden, som vi arbejder med den her type af udfordringer og løsninger. På øh, don'ts siden, øh, der vil vi nævne, at øh, I skal undgå at tænke bæredygtighed som noget, der er nice to have. Øh, det er absolut noget, der er license to operate. Det er noget, der, der er behov for, øh, at, man, at han har et take på for at være en spiller i markedet i, i fremtiden. Så det er ikke noget, der er valgfrit. Det er noget, I bør se nærmere på snarest muligt, hvis det er ikke noget, I allerede kigger på i dag. Lad være med at vente for længe. Reguleringerne er her allerede, og de kommer til at ændre sig undervejs i de kommende år. Så jo før I kommer i gang, jo bedre. Der er allerede et pres fra omverdenen, så lad være med at vente på, at I mærker det pres på at forudsige behovet, eller hvad med at vente på, at jeres kunder kommer til jer og fortæller, hvad de vil have, men prøv at sætte jer ind i, hvad deres konkrete behov er, og i talesæt dem, før de selv gør. I forhold til, hvad vi anbefaler, at I rent faktisk gør, så samarbejde. Som jeg nævnte før, sørg for at få engageret og mobiliseret hele organisationen og samarbejde internt med at finde de gode løsninger. Men overvej også, om det giver mening at samarbejde med eksterne parter, partnere, leverandører, kunder osv. Vær ambitiøse. Det er de virksomheder, som øh, sætter sig ind i ESG øh, og lader det gennemsyre alle deres aktiviteter, som får et forspring øh, og som også får muligheden for øh, rent faktisk at udløse deres fulde potentiale. Og så brug teknologi til at accelerere jeres transformationsrejse. Der findes rigtig mange gode værktøjer derude, øh, som I kan gøre brug af øh, og som kan hjælpe jer godt på vej. Og det er noget, det Richard vil fortælle øh, en lille smule mere om. Så jeg... Øh, men med de ord, giv uh, tæten videre til dig, Richard. Cool. Um, thank you very much, Ida. Uh, I guess you need to know that I'm going to do my part in English. Um, I don't think Jesper quite prepared you for that. <laughs> so um, I hope that's okay. And in fact, Joe, who comes after me, will also speak in English. But she has the excuse of being part of our UK practice. <laughs> I've been in Denmark 10 years, but... I blame you guys for speaking such good English. Right, so I'm going to talk about technology. Um, and I want to try, as Jesper said earlier, to try and make this as sort of practical and useful as we can. So we're going to choose a use case that we've come working a lot with our clients on at the moment. We think it should be something that you're also thinking about. If I can jump on. But to start with, I want to reference back to the picture that Ida showed you before. Clearly, and I think this is probably not a surprise, technology is a key enabler for the sustainably driven business transformation. Um, and I think we've here tried to label out in those five, um, five steps where we think the IT part or the technology part plays a role. And I'm not going to jump through all of them, but maybe there's a couple that I think are, are very relevant. So in the maturity and baselining, data management and governance baseline, you're going to hear me talk a lot about data. Our clients are talking a lot about the problems with getting the right data to do this regulatory reporting, which I'll double, double click on in a moment. Um, yeah, through that, of course, working out your management and governance, working out your strategy and your IT strategy for this um, through to implementing implementing some of that data governance, implementing some of that data migration, cleansing, ensuring you have the correct data and having the technology that supports that role, 
all the way through to some of this exciting stuff, for example, AI. And we are seeing more and more AI dri data driven decision making, um, which, um, you know, in PwC, we're working an awful lot with this, this AI stuff too. And this link between AI and sustainability is also a big, a big, uh, a big internal discussion and a lot of development happening in that space. But that's not the focus of today. The focus of today is really these four letters, CSRD. Um, if you've listened to the previous webinars, I'm sure those four letters have come up in every one of those webinars. And I'm sorry to repeat the same message, but this is the sort of biggest driver that we're seeing with our customers at the moment. And we want to make this webinar as sort of practical practical and tangible as we can. So CSRD, if you haven't heard it before, is this Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. We've written it at the top box in there. And that is really a directive from the EU around sustainability reporting. Um, and I'll double click a bit more on that in the next couple of slides. And as we've said here, one of the big parts relating to that is data management and sustainability data. And it needs to be integrated into the existing processes and IT systems. You need to have a good handle on that data. And in a lot of places, go and find that data. Um, I guess other key elements to recognize here, sustainability requirements tend to then become parts of larger IT transformation projects. And it's key to sort of integrate those together um, and then the last part, which I'll talk about a little bit again later on, is that there is clearly a lot of vendors in this space trying to support with this CSRD reporting. And it can be difficult to navigate that space. Um, and yeah, so we're very conscious of that and sympathetic to that. I'm going to try not to talk too quickly, especially as maybe not all of you work in English regularly. So trying to remind myself to do that. You may have, in fact, seen this slide before, um, but CSRD is a game changer for Danish and EU businesses. Um, just quickly, what does CSRD really mean for companies? So we go from, starting at the top there, that pre-CSRD, we have voluntary standards and norms. They now become hard law. I hope you've heard this before, but just to reconfirm that. But there are some key advantages of that. Um, in fact, in the past, there were a number of competing standards and frameworks, and now there's really one consolidated universal standard. Um, previously, there were also quantitative and qualitative um, data requirements, but I'm afraid a lot of companies were also performing some sort of anecdotal reporting. And the future will be much more around these quantitative and qualitative reporting, um, including targets. Things like policies and plans are also embedded in there. The next one is something that you may have heard quite a lot. And Ida made a quick mention of it earlier, this materiality. So what's slightly unusual about the CSRD is that you don't have to report everything. What you have to do is perform a materiality assessment or double materiality assessment. And based off that, that defines what your reporting requirements are. And I know that a lot of companies are out there doing these double materiality assessments as we speak. We're certainly working a lot with them at the moment. And then the last part, which is maybe the most crucial, was in the past there was optional assurance. In the future, when this goes live, which for larger listed companies will be the end of 2024, there will be a requirement for limited assurance on this data, on this CSRD data. And that will move to a reasonable assurance, um, so a level similar to your financial reporting within a few years. So it needs to be done in a controlled, structured, governed way, essentially. And that feeds a lot of what we will, what I will talk about next and how we work with this. So now I'll go to quite a, no, let's jump through this one quickly. This is um, just to give you some sense of what that reporting is about if you're not familiar with it. 
essentially there are a number of different boxes with different reporting types. And a way to think about this is this is a little bit like IFRS, except for sustainability. This is a lot of definitions on how you need to report these sustainability quantitative and qualitative metrics. I just want to show your eye a bit down to the bottom right. Um, it's something like up to a thousand data points embedded in these reporting standards, these European sustainability reporting standards, which are the standards that sit underneath CSRD. So I guess my message is this is substantial and companies are seeing that this is substantial. And therefore, our recommendation for how to work with this is to do this in a, in a structured way, to do this in a yeah, sort of thought out, careful way to make sure that you can deliver on these requirements to that limited assurance level going to reasonable assurance in the future. All right, this was the page. That I'm sort of excited to show you. So this is essentially our structured way of moving from where you are today to where you need to be with implementing technology to support your CSRD reporting requirements, those ESRS, those European Sustainability Reporting Standards, that we believe that you need to have an, a structured approach to to deliver those data points that we're talking about um, previously. Um, and we've split this into five sections. We tend to like to break things into five sections. So the first one is a become ready section. This is sort of a pre-start section. And I'll actually double click a bit on this in the next slide. Um, and of course, this is the way we work with it, um, and we thought that that would be useful for you. There can be, of course, variations about how you do this internally. But we start with an inspiration day, a sort of kickoff day, and I'll go through how we structure that inspiration day in the next slide. Um, and then after that inspiration day, we try and get as tangible and practical as we can, where we go straight into a proof of concept, a POC. Normally, we take one, maybe two of the KPIs of one of the, of the data points from ESRS that we've talked about in the inspiration day and try and run that through a system. Um, very often, that's an off-the-shelf system, and we'll talk a bit about what systems are out there and which ones we're working with. And um, my colleague Joe will then talk about the Workiva solution in that, in that space. And once we've done that POC, then we enter into this requirements and selection section of the, uh, of, the, of the steps towards maturity. And today, actually, I'll only go really go as far as that requirements and selection. The reason being is that's where clients are right now. Um, we're very happy to talk about the scoping phase and the implementation phase and indeed the operations phase later on. But really, our clients tend to be in these beginning phases at the moment. So that's where I'm going to focus that, if that's OK. And that requirements and selections phase, we've really broken it into four key parts. And I'm going through that in an order now, but I have to say the order can be varied. Um, and as you can see with all these little nicely drawn arrows, um, there, there can be backs and some forwards and few iterations made to do this to get it to the level that you, that you need. So we start in this section with understanding the specific business requirements. Um, as you'll see in a sec, we will have already done some of that in the inspiration day. But because there's so many of these um, data requirements, you do need to approach each one individually. And then from that, we then define the data requirements. Because, as I've said earlier, the data and managing the data and locating the data and enabling that data to be controlled to the right level is a key, key um, part of being able to deliver this to the level of limited assurance. That's what that next section is about. From there, we then start to think about, OK, what is the organization or Actually, first of all, what is the process? What are the people process that needs to be in place to ensure that we get that data correctly and it gets controlled to the right level? 
From that, we then think about what is the organization that will do that. And once we've got all of those things enable, uh, set out, then we will look at the technology. And of course, choosing the right technology, whether that is an off-the-shelf application or an inbuilt application or some combination of applications you already use, um, that decision and embedding that in the architecture is a, is a key, key next step. And I'm now going to double click a little bit more back into that inspiration day, but you'll recognize that it's also somewhat similar to what we've talked about in that requirements and selection. Okay. And so this is the way we essentially structure the, the kickoff to this, to this delivery. We look at the same four elements that are in that requirements and selection process and embed that into this inspiration workshop. Um, and the way we've run that so far is um, we start with using people from my department. I come from the sustainability advisory and assurance department. We're the people that know the regulations well, essentially. Um, that might be me or some of my colleagues um, that will then do a we tend to do a fairly slow start to enable the room because there'll be sustainability people there as well as um, IT people or some of the change management people um, to understand the business requirement and to go through the sort of where's and why's so that we know why we're moving this direction. And But fairly quickly, we then start to focus in on one or two KPIs. And quite often, it's just one KPI. We try and choose a KPI that will really test this out, but give you a very good sense of what is needed and what are the challenges here that perhaps don't exist with financial reporting. From that discussion, we then go into these data requirements element. And what we try to do then is we format that data. We locate where that data could be available for your organization. We format, I guess, lightly data model that data um, so that you can see where that data is, what sort of structure it needs to be in, how it works together, some of the challenges that can occur with using that data. And also start to bring in some of these data governance concepts, um, including some of the roles and responsibilities for some of the, uh, the, some of the departments with regards to that data. That then leads into some of the process discussions, some of the data governance roles, how to ensure data quality, et cetera, then leads to the data processes. And then it's very much in the organization skills and processes element. That's where we bring in some of the people from our governance, risk, and compliance department, also often from our CFO advisory department, because the finance teams often play a very large role in some of this because we're talking a lot about controls. We're trying to make sure this is a, a risk-based approach to ensuring that the data is correct and um, reported correctly. So designing processes that enable, um, that enable the, uh, the, uh, the, the data to be worked in the right way. And then from there, we then move with those sort of understanding of how this, um, how this process works, we then move into the technology discussion. And that's very much about choosing the technology. And in a lot with this environment, it's about navigating all of those vendors out there and what the options are and how they work. Um, and with that, we bring in some of the people from the technology and security and also from our ERP integration teams to support with that. And I guess my message overall is this it really needs to be a cross-organization um, cross piece of work to get this to the right level, keeping those regulatory experts, which for us is my department, but for you it was probably your sustainability department, all across this discussion to ensure that you meet those requirements to that limited assurance level. And I think I'm running a little behind, so I'll not spend a lot of time on this slide, especially as we'll have some talking from Workiva in a moment. But just to say that these are some of the key um, vendors out there working in this, in this space to support this CSRD reporting requirements that we're working 
together with SAP obviously have big ERP systems and there's some similarity and they have a, a, a suite of solutions, Workiva that we'll hear about and then Microsoft, a lot of companies in Denmark have Microsoft in, infrastructure and their solutions can also work well for a lot of the companies. I want to ask if there's any questions, but I guess we'll come to questions in a minute. I think I can jump ahead now. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everybody, um, and thanks for having me on your uh, Danish webcast. Um, I think it's um, useful to, to level set on, on what uh, we mean when we say um, Workiva, um, and also why, as PwC, uh, we have chosen Workiva as an alliance partner. Naturally, um, we may have worked with your organization in the past, and you'll be well aware that PwC is a, not a technology provider. Um, and as you've heard from my colleagues today, that um, using technology in your sustainability reporting transformation journey is, is vital for success. And, and we believe that. And, and that's why we have partnered with some key technology firms and organizations who we believe um, can deliver the the software to to enable your sustainability reporting journey. So, who are Workiva? Uh, Workiva are a cloud-based software uh, provider, and they formed 15 years ago uh, in response to the um, SEC and SOX environment in the United States of America. Um, and as you can see on the wheel here, they have. Uh, built and progressed their solution uh, to encompass many um, different areas within the platform itself. The newest um, uh, and most exciting, in my humble opinion, is the ESG reporting solution, which has been uh, built and is continually updated for all of the new sustainability reporting standards that are being developed. And as, as Richard and Ida mentioned earlier, CSRD is obviously hugely prevalent and hugely impactful to a number of organizations across EMEA and the globe. And Workiva are uh, reacting to that by bringing in all of those regulations within the platform itself. We have many clients and organizations that, that use Workiva across their, their broader reporting uh, landscape, uh, predominantly in the financial reporting or governance risk and compliances, as Richard mentioned. And so we see it as a natural evolution there to, to help with your sustainability reporting. One other element I did want to touch on is, is that cloud-based software. I think there is a, um, a fear when it comes to IT and technology and what that means to organizations from um, an implementation roadmap and I think hangover from, from decades past with um, kind of hardware implementations that take months, if not, not years, and take a lot of people out of the business for a long time. The, a major benefit of an Work Heaver implementation is, is that it can be mere weeks and then you would work with us as PwC as a Work Heaver implementation partner to configure the software and the tool uh, to meet your business needs um, and set you up for success in the future. If I move on, there's a lot going on on, on this slide, but what I wanted to, to pull out as some highlights were in that top left box are those frameworks and standards that uh, Workiva recognize are important and vital to for businesses to report against, the newest obviously being FRAG, CSRD, and those ESRSs, but also recognizing that there's a lot of voluntary reporters in the market already. And so actually there is choice and flexibility when uh, using Workiva as a, as a reporting tool. And actually we can help you set up and configure that platform for your existing voluntary reporting, whether that be under GRI, for example, or if you align your business strategy with any of the, the UN's SDGs. Another huge benefit of the Workiva platform that we see really benefiting our clients is that as a market leader in the last mile reporting, it sits across your existing technology uh, stack and your technology environment and can link in with 
those um, those other technologies. So, for example, if you need your uh, HR data to get, meet your social standard requirements, Workiva can build an API um, and have that automated data feed from Workday, for example. Or as Richard mentioned, we have SAP as another key alliance partner and Workiva and SAP can work very well together with those automatic data feeds uh, pulling into the reporting tool that Workiva offers. Naturally, PwC and Workiva um, have worked together for a number of years, and, and we've built a number of accelerators that support our implementations um, to help you as organizations on, on your journey. Um, in particular, when we think about CSRD, as, as we discussed earlier on the webcast, double materiality is a huge exercise that no doubt somebody yourself or somebody in your organization is going through right now. And actually feeding that through the Workiva platform, there is a double materiality um, tool within, within the platform itself to then highlight, obviously, those key topics um, that need reporting against aligning with those metrics and targets and, and disclosure requirements. Um, PwC are a proud uh, partner with, with Workiva. Um, we have recently been um, uh, awarded the Global uh, Managed Service Partner of the Year, as well as the EMA Partner of the Year, really reflecting the, um, the amount and quality of implementations we are supporting Workiva through and organizations through. And we are looking forward to um, working with lots of you in, in the sustainability reporting space. I wanted to touch on the, the managed service element there. That might be a, a term that you're not aware of. So as well as uh, you're, you yourselves purchasing a Workiva license and using PwC to implement the software for your reporting needs, PwC can also offer you what is what we call a, a managed service. And what that means is we use the Workiva tool ourselves to deliver your reporting. And this may be if you are um, an organization that doesn't necessarily have an, its own sustainability department, doesn't have the kind of resource capability to meet the needs of all the new sustainability reporting standards, um, we, can, we can help provide that service for you. And because of our belief in, in Workiva as a tool, we use our own Workiva platform to deliver that reporting. I just wanted to end on something that really aligns with what Richard was talking about, about those kind of um, initial workshops um, and discovery sessions. What we found really powerful as um, organizations are thinking through what ESG means to them and the sustainability reporting standards, we have developed what we call the PwC Workiva Experience Center. And that really is a chance for, for you as a cross-functional organizational team coming to PwC and we'll help you not only give you live demos of the Workiva platform itself, but really pull out what that means to an organization, how it can work across those business areas, in particular with the, the impact of sustainability reporting to your financial reporting teams, to your controls, internal audit teams, um, and really pull out those kind of key areas of challenge in change management and how the, the Workiva platform can help solve some of those problems. So if you're keen to hear more, um, we're obviously here to help and, and would love to carry on the conversation. Um, I'm gonna hand back to Jesper now as um, there's lots of questions coming in on the webcast. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yes, uh, I think we have uh, four really, really good questions and we have 10 minutes to answer them. So, so I think that's perfect. I'll actually start by asking you, Ida, a question. I'll, I'll do that in Danish, uh, since the question was also put in Danish. So, Ida, do you tell a little bit about this here upskilling? And it's seems so important for to be a success in your transformation process. But many businesses can not just begin to train leaders and medarbeiders, and so are they ready for it. They are going to start finde ud af, hvordan, hvordan er vores produkt egentlig, hvordan skal det se ud i fremtiden, hvad er vores processer og metoder til det her. Så hvad er egentlig rækkefølgen i det her, hvordan arbejder man med det? Okay, makes sense. And thank you for the question and for the uh, opportunity to, to elaborate. I'm going to answer it in, in English so that everyone can follow. Um, so my first key message is, uh, first of all, that 
knowledge about sustainability and ESG is absolutely crucial for you to succeed in the transformation journey. In order for you to find those solutions for the future and uh, in order to really develop those solutions, you need people to be mobilized, right? Uh, so there needs to be a level of knowledge in the organization about sustainability. Um, so knowledge is important. That's my first key message. Second, uh, what I would urge you to do is to look into what is your specific need in your organization, because uh, I would argue that it differs quite a lot uh, between different companies, right? So uh, this feeds back to my point earlier on, look into what are your current capabilities within this area? What are your future capabilities supposed to be? What does that look like? And how do you close that gap? It might not be that you are able to, at this point, upskill a lot of people because you don't know yet what you need to upskill them in. Just know that this is crucial for you to succeed. So what I would argue is that you start with analyzing those needs uh, and looking into other different subsets of your organization that you could also own already now upskill to some extent uh, and who should follow at a later point. Um, also, when it comes to finding the right courses, learnings, and so on, uh, this also really ties close to that particular need that you have in your organization. So I would urge you to look into what are your needs and is it something that can be accommodated by sending leadership on a sustainability uh, learning journey? Uh, do you need to look into developing your own upskilling programs? Um, can you do that yourself? Do you need to partner uh, with someone to do that? So start with your specific needs and also look into uh, uh, the coming years uh, and the cadence and sequence of learning that you're um, uh, foreseeing. I hope that makes sense. No, I think it does. Thank you, Ida. Um, another question that's maybe for, for you, Richard, and, and you, Joe. So so when you work with, uh, with clients out there, uh, what do you see in terms of uh, willingness to uh, to uh, uh, to maybe not have um, a maximization of your profit, but actually spending uh, what you need in terms of investment into into this area? So, the question being, are the companies willing to actually uh, you know say okay, forget about profit for for a couple of years or at least in short term, and then really invest in in uh, in in becoming more sustainable? Is is that what we're seeing? Is that what you're seeing? I start with you, Richard. Yeah, and I'm going to give you the classic consultant answer. <laughs> it depends, yeah. but I have to say, if I was to say what is how have I seen it change over the time, um, more and more so companies are accepting or um, preparing for the long term. And we see more and more CEOs that really want to embrace this longer term journey into sustainability. They see the opportunities um, that, that being more sustainable brings. And in some way, maybe the European region, but maybe even more specifically, the Nordic region can lead the way here and get greater opportunities globally by leading the way here. Um, and so with that, people are more and more aware of, of the importance of focusing or, and I think this comes as part of the double materiality assessment, if, if you've gone through that, identifying more and more of the opportunities that can come on the back of this sustainability. And then once you can identify and even calculate them, then the decisions about investments can be done in a better way. I've definitely seen uh, a change or an improvement or an expansion in that space. I heard a small yes there. Yes. A small yes. Yes. Joe, what's your point of view on that? Are I you would, seeing the same? I would agree with a small yes. And I, I think the thing I would want to pull out is that I'm talking to a lot of clients around the fact that CSRD is a, is a huge compliance ask, but actually that there is a, to Richard's point, and a smattering of those longer term views of actually, let's not just respond for, to the compliance exercise, but use it as an opportunity to, to elicit behavioral change in an organization. And I think that is actually the real opportunity with the new sustainability reporting standards, because it is going to impact businesses as a whole. 
it can't be responded to by a small team in a silo, in a corner, in an organization. It's going to require input and, and buy-in from, from the larger organization. And so I'm having really productive conversations about that. All right. We also have a question from uh, from someone from maybe a, a somewhat smaller company who is not obliged to do the reporting first of January. So, in terms of technology, what are we looking at there? Uh, is this uh, the reporting technology that's important for those, or, or uh, Richard, what, what what do you think about that? Yeah, the the tricky thing when you're a small company that doesn't have the requirements is that you may be lured into thinking that you don't have to think about this. But very, very often you work with a larger company that does need to deal with it, and then you're as good as have their requirements too. Um, and if you don't, you often have a customer base that does. And if you don't, you will at some point soon. And that's sort of a lot of the discussions we're having. Then getting back to what is the specific technology that you would use to do your reporting there, and that, of course, depends. Um, and, you know, uh, there are a lot of players in the market. It may depend specifically on what requirements those suppliers or customers are making on you. If it's just related to CO2, there's certainly a lot of vendors that relate to CO2. There is a risk, of course, that those requirements will become fuller from those suppliers. Um, and so, but we're also sympathetic. You can't invest in a, into a massive solution necessarily right now. But maybe to put it into some context, even the smaller companies use some sort of ERP system to do their financial reporting. And this is as complex. So at some point, there will be investments even by the smaller companies in, in, in off-the-shelf solutions, in my humble opinion. Okay, and then finally, maybe just a very quick question. So someone asked uh, Workiva, is that a English cloud solution or does it have a translation to uh, local countries, uh, local languages? Yes, absolutely. And, and we've got plenty of organizations that produce uh, reports in English and in their, in their local um, language. And the, the power of that platform is that it is customizable to that extent. And um, in particular for some of our larger organizations who perhaps use a design agency in producing their annual reporting and their sustainability reporting, um, they can be brought into the platform as well. So can do their work directly within, within the Workiva platform, whether that be in, in English or Danish or, or whatever language you Excellent. report under. Awesome. All right. I think we're closing to an end here, right? So, uh, so I just want, uh, before we, we, we say goodbye, um, I just want to, uh, to just show you and tell you that, that we have a, a long list of, of webinars. We have some that we already had, and we have some uh, that will come in the future. So, uh, so uh, if, if there's any of these uh, themes or any of these headlines that are interesting for you, then you can uh, either go and, and, and download them or or have a have a or sign up for the future ones, um, and then I think I'll I'll just uh, finish up with this slide. So, if there are any other questions than the ones that uh, we've uh, answered uh, now, you know, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. And if you think we didn't elaborate not uh, enough on your specific answer or your specific question, then we are happy to elaborate on that as well. So, uh, so. Thank you so much, uh, I assume, from everyone. Thank you. Thank you.